Just a side note before we get into this episode. The following episode of True Crime Conversations was recorded remotely. It was the afternoon of April 15, 2003, when residents of Lawn and Wye River, seaside towns on the shoreline of the Great Ocean Road, noticed something they'd never seen before. It was a cargo ship. Of course they saw big ships every day, but this was something different. The 106 metre long vessel came to within 500 metres of the rocks scattered along the coastline. Two teenagers playing nearby even tried throwing stones at it. Lifelong lawn resident Dick Davies remembers thinking, what the fuck? You're gonna get washed on the rocks. The swell was the strongest it had been in years and the ship was clearly struggling. The coastline is known for its shipwrecks and it looked like this could be yet another. What no one knew at the time was that the ship knew precisely where it was going and that the following day, a search of the beach at Boggley Creek would show up the lifeless body of a man alongside a small dinghy. Who was he and where had he come from? The Australian Federal Police already had an idea, but they could not have known how far and how deep this case was about to run. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking to investigative journalist Richard Baker. Richard is the host of The Last Voyage of the Pong Su, a podcast from The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Richard researched and hosted the 10-episode podcast, exploring the vast web of criminal activity around the ill-fated cargo ship, ranging from a North Korean dictator, drug rings, the Australian police, a pursuit at sea, and that's just part of the story. In 2003, North Korean cargo ship the Pong Su comes dangerously close to Australia's Great Ocean Road shoreline. What do coastal locals see of the ship? Well, the first they see of it is around a lunchtime. And so there's a little pub on the Great Ocean Road at this tiny little hamlet called Wai River. And the pub's called the Rookery Nook. And so the people were in there either having a beer or just finishing their counter lunch. And they saw this 100 metre long cargo ship, like just right out the window. So it looked like you could almost touch it. That's very unusual. So just going, what the hell is going on here? Um, is this ship in trouble? And then it sort of tracked up further up the coast towards uh, Lawn, which is a, a, a major town on the Great Ocean Road in Victoria. And same thing, it was just hanging around and the locals are going, what is going on? You know, is this ship in trouble? Because they really, really were worried it was going to run aground. And obviously when you've got a 100 metre long cargo ship running aground in such a pristine place, you've got, you know, obviously concern for the crew and stuff, but also environmental concerns and things like that. That was really what people were going on about. And I even found a note actually by a local Victoria policeman there in his diary made a note about seeing the ship around Wye River and he'd been on the station down there for nearly 20 years and he'd said he'd never seen a ship that close to shore before of that size. So did they alert authorities or were the police already onto it? No, the, so the Australian Federal Police were the ones on this heroin case and so they knew that there was a big delivery or shipment of heroin coming into Australia and into Melbourne at that time, but they had no idea how it was going to be delivered. Um, they thought it would be by sea, but normally that's often like in a cargo or, you know, container brought off a ship at the docks or something like that. They didn't really have this in mind. So at the time the locals were seeing it from the pub and in lawn and stuff like that, the Australian Federal Police had no idea that that ship had arrived. And it wasn't until later that night when they were following some of the... Um, onshore syndicate, crime syndicate members who were to receive the drugs, following them into lawn, that they saw this huge illuminated ship 
not that far out and in sort of rocking around in eight to ten foot heavy, heavy surf. So I want to go to who is actually on this ship. There's a skipper named Songman's son. How would you describe him? So from what I've been told by people who knew him and got to know him quite well, tough, early to mid 60s, like a hardened seafarer. He'd seen a lot, been through a lot, pretty stoic and seemed to have the respect of all the crew who served under him. And according to experienced mariners and, and like ship's captains, they thought he was pretty crazy but pretty skillful in a, being able to manoeuvre his ship into the spots it got to without, you know, having it run aground or something like that. They thought, yeah, he's 50% nuts, 50% genius seaman. So how many people are on this ship? As you say, it's, it's this cargo ship that's everyone's struck by how big it is. How many people are actually on it? So there was, including the captain and his crew, 30. So 30, 30 sailors. Um, included in that 30 was a guy actually who wasn't a sailor. He was a political secretary. So he was uh, the representative of the North Korean, well, the only political party in North Korea, the Korean Workers' Party. And his job was to ensure discipline and no one sort of got stepped out of line, I suppose, because these guys had a bit of a privileged position in that they were one of the few people that could actually get out of their country and see the world. So the political secretary was there to keep tabs and, and, and keep discipline. So that's the crew. There were two other special passengers, if you like. And these were the guys, these guys weren't normal sailors. And they were the ones who brought the 150 kilograms of heroin on board the boat on a little island close to North Korea called Sister Island. And we got to know them and the Australian police were given the names um, of Tasa Wong. Uh, he was one of them. And there was another guy who we don't know his name because he actually drowned bringing the um, heroin ashore from the Pong Su um, to, the Victor to the Australian um, shoreline. So those two guys are a mystery. They're definitely North Korean. But if I had to have my best guess, those guys would be perhaps um, have had some military or other training or background to perform that role. So what did life look like on the ship? How long had they sort of been on there before they got to that coastline and what had the routine been? So they... It was built in 1980. Originally, it was a Japanese-built ship. Uh, so by 2003, and it had been in the hands of the North Koreans for quite a while, it was pretty run down, like not a very comfortable place at all to live, held together kind of by a coat of paint, dark, rusty, unsafe. And on this journey, it was carrying no cargo, so other than the heroin. So it was bouncing around a lot in the ocean too. So they were on board. I think they left North Korea in mid-February 2003, and then travelled over to China, picked up actually a load of like a mineral sand, and then picked up these guys in the heroin, dropped off the mineral sand in Jakarta, and then made their way around the west coast of Australia. So by the time they got to Victoria and the Great Ocean Road, save for a couple of days where they got um, some shore leave in Jakarta, they'd been on board maybe six weeks. Yeah, so pretty um, pretty tough. And the Australian authorities had been uh, sort of tracking them, as, as you say, and secretly they began secretly bugging conversations. What sort of things were they hearing? Yeah, so the Australian Federal Police got a tip off in late March, early April, that there'd been a couple of men arrive from a flight uh, from Beijing into Australia who their information or their, their sources were telling them we're going to be involved in this major heroin shipment. So they started following these guys around Crown Casino in Melbourne and they were acting a bit sus and, uh, and you know, meeting certain people around the city and then driving all the way down to the coastline of the Great Ocean Road, uh, which is what a lot of tourists do. But these guys were doing it and stopping off at spots. So they got a warrant to install a listening device in the Toyota Tarago that they'd rented. And that picked up some really interesting conversations between 
two of the two of the men. And in those, at one time, one of them actually asked, um, "Do you think they, the police could be listening to us? Could be listening to us now?" And the other guy goes, you know, "Don't be stupid. Only the FBI in America can do that." And so. These conversations were happening in different Asian dialects and by the time they were getting translated, it was, you know, roughly a few hours before the police could hear, but they all got a fairly good chuckle out of that one thinking that, oh, my God, these guys, they don't know what they're in for sort of thing. Um, And it picked up a lot of other really good stuff as well as time went on. They travelled from Melbourne, had a conversation in the vehicle. The second male made comments relating to Ting's involvement in international drug trafficking and that uh, penalties for the type of activities they were going to be undertaking would in some cases be 20 years and in other cases five. And this led the AFP to now feel pretty certain that Teng was definitely involved in an imminent importation into Australia of narcotics. In relation to the narcotics, they were calling girlfriends. They were talking about picking up the girlfriends, handing the girlfriends on to others, and at the same time that the girlfriends would be delivered by speedboat. We knew there was possibly boats involved. We knew there was 150 units, or that was the figure they were talking. Units are a 300 gram block, a 700 gram block. It depends on their particular jargon, the criminal's jargon. If you look at it in terms of the street value, each kilo is a million dollars, and that's probably an underestimation. So we knew we were dealing with a minimum of $50 million worth of drugs up to $150 million worth of drugs. And the higher the stakes the, the criminals are playing with, the more danger, obviously, for everybody involved. And so there's this Asian syndicate on the ground and, of course, this this ship coming in. Where exactly was the ship headed and why was it headed there? Like, of all places in Australia, why was it that particular spot? That's an excellent question. No one knows why that spot. So that spot was obviously... That was was the spot they chose uh, because... We had the onshore crew, if you like, of of three guys who'd been sent out to meet the ship when those drugs were brought ashore in a small boat, small motorboat, and that was the rendezvous point. Now, obviously, some of the drugs you would then suspect were destined for sort of distribution in Melbourne, but the best intelligence the AFP had and still has was that the majority of it was actually going to be bound for the Sydney market. So... I don't know why you would choose the Great Ocean Road at that time of year, which is the biggest sort of swell, like the the Rip Curl Bells Pro surfing competitions on right at that time, um, 50 minutes away from where this happened. So, you know, it's it's usually really solid surf. So why you would do that there, I I don't know. And it wasn't well thought out. Perhaps it displayed a lack of um, clear lack of local knowledge, I suspect. Can you tell us a little bit more about the conditions? Because the conditions are sort of central to what ends up happening. What, as, as you say, there's this cargo ship and they're sort of bouncing around because they don't have a lot on it. But what is the sea like during that time? Yeah, so the weather was tr- atrocious down at Lawn and Wai River at that time of year. It, um, there was a really big sort of... Um, Oh, just a sort of storm event blowing up from the Southern Ocean and from Antarctica, it's just this cold air mass and it was pelting down with rain, really windy and the sea was the biggest swell people had seen in a couple of years, it was building and building and, and would have reached its peak um, late at night, which is when they chose to do the, the operation and, and what the operation involved was the Pong Su getting maybe and at between two and 500 metres from the land. And they dropped a small, like you'd see on a Bondi Rescue or something, a lifeguard, you know, like those um, life-saving rubber duckies with a little motor on the back, dropped that with the two guys and 150 kilos of heroin in it and sent them through the, you know, they were to use that to try and get to shore. And what happened was it was a new boat and they hadn't primed the outboard motor properly and it cut out halfway through. So then they would have been floating in the dark with a a 10-foot wave crashing down on them from behind. And so that's a wave. So you measure it from the back, the the height of a wave. So that's a a good 20-foot face smacking down on them in the dark. So it would have been absolutely terrifying. And I'm amazed that actually one of them survived. You know, one one drowned and they got him ashore. 
And that caused a lot of the drugs to sort of disperse. And again, amazingly, this guy who survived and the other guy waiting for him on the beach managed to find five of the six packages of the heroin. So they got all but 25 kilos of it recovered. Uh, but obviously the guy couldn't get back out to the Pong Su. He was stuck. So, yeah, it was just this crazy scene. And, and one of the things that really attracted me to telling it in a podcast was knowing that the um, listening device in the Tarago, which was parked in the car park above the beach, picked up a lot of the conversations and drama and action from the beach about having one dead body there and so much heroin and all that sort of stuff. So it was a great audio thing to have, a great tool for us. So, yeah, it was, a, it was an absolutely crazy night. And it was also on the birthday of North Korea's founding leader. And they'd had uh, a bit of a feast on board and quite a lot of the crew were allowed to drink. And so many of them reported being drunk whilst all this was going on as well. So it was just this insane scene. And that body of the man who who didn't survive uh, sort of was found washed up on the beach. Who found that body and, and what what did they do? What did they do in terms of an investigation once they have this dead body? They'd done a pretty good effort in the circumstances. This is the guy who survived and the, um, the guy who met him on the beach. And they buried him in a makeshift grave. So he was concealed pretty well. So he had a lot of kelp, seaweed and rocks covering him. And it was the next morning when the AFP had arrested two of the, the drugs traffickers and found drugs in their car in lawn in the morning. So they had a major crime scene on their hand. Someone reported seeing a washed up dinghy on the beach um, about nine kilometres away. So they all headed down to that beach, which is called Boggley Creek. And uh, yeah, the motorboat was there. And then they started looking in the rocks and thought maybe there's more, more drugs buried here or something. And they saw, you know, this mound, I guess, in the rocks of seaweed and thought, oh, maybe they've hidden it under that. And then they actually filmed this and, a, and a, one of the AFP guys pulls back the seaweed and then jumps back and goes, oh, shit, it's a dead body. And that caused then they had to call in the Victorian Homicide Squad because it was a dead body in suspicious circumstances. So the Victorian police had carriage over that until they could work out what happened. So then the Victorian detectives come down and, and um, try and work out what happened and obviously the coroner's office gets involved and, and all of that sort of stuff. So it was certainly something they weren't expecting to find in what was just going to be a big drug operation. It's a dead person. Holy shit. Dead? And can you talk us through the dramatic chase at sea uh, in an attempt to stop the Pongsu? So the Pongsu um, didn't, it could have taken off like, like that night. It, they could have just gone, we're going to get out of here. Um, but for some reason, and I suspect it was to give the guy called Wong who survived in the dinghy a chance to get back out, even though his boat was, his little dinghy was mm. cactus. So I think that was quite admirable that they stuck around. So they were still there in the morning, this big ship still getting tossed around. They would have seen all the police and that on shore gathering and, you know, known that everything had gone belly up. And the federal police were actually trying to get hold of a, a local fisherman's boat to go out with some well-armed guys and storm the Pong Su there and then. And they were about to leave the lawn pier to go and do that and then all of a sudden a big australian air force sort of coast guard plane just buzzed the tower of the pong Su. came from nowhere police didn't know it was coming or anything like that and that that caused the captain of the pong Su to go right i've had enough of this we're getting out of here and he just set sail for the horizon and that then was a catalyst for like a four-day chase at sea in again really tough conditions so firstly, a Tasmanian police boat had to maintain what's called a hot pursuit. So under international law, for Australia to apprehend, to seize the Pong Su in international waters or whatever, they had to maintain a hot pursuit. So that pursuit couldn't be broken. So the Tasmanian police boat and their crew powered through these heavy seas and then handed over to a New South Wales boat called the Fearless. 
And then those conditions got so dangerous. Like it was like the 1998 Sydney to Hobart conditions where they lost eight lives. And there, that, that, that police boat had to maintain a hot pursuit until an Australian Navy warship called the HMA Stewart uh, got itself ready and got a crew of um, SAS troops flown over from Perth to go out and take over the hot pursuit and board the Pong Su. And that happened over four days. And there's a lot of radio messages between the police boats and the Pong Su and the radio operator on the ship who could speak reasonable English. And they were just coming up with some of the pretty lame excuses about why they wouldn't stop or why they wouldn't return to port. Like one was like, captain is sleeping in, captain is up, but he has to have breakfast first. I can't get you an answer. Just things like that. So just buying time. And because they were getting instructions from um, from North Korea, from head office back in North Korea about what to do. And some of those messages were like, stop the ship and fight. Others were like, keep flying. The ship was, uh, sorry, sailing under the flag of Tuvalu, the tiny little Pacific nation, not under a North Korean flag. So the one message said, don't show our flag, keep that other one up and just stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there was a four-day chase and then eventually the SAS and the Navy got ready to, um, to board it. You have been told and warned numerous times. Are you altering course back to even port over? No, no, he's making a run for it. Come on, Sue, if you do not stop your vessel or alter course, we will stop your vessel, or the Australian government will stop your, your vessel using any method available. We were tasked to follow the ship and to cover it. Meantime, the people back in headquarters were getting the people most skilled and best equipped to do the actual takeout of the of the vessel. Motor vessel Pong Su, this is Australian warship. Rig your pilot ladder starboard side now. General, the at the present now, my crew members now sleeping now, so waiting some moment. Allah. No, sir. Please awake them up. I intend to board you. Over. So I'm interested in the role of North Korea more broadly here, and the leader Kim Jong the second. How does he come into it? So in North Korea, obviously with international sanctions, so all this happened at a time when North Korea was really annoying the Americans and many of the, on the United Nations because it kept trying to get nuclear weapons technology and, you know, missile technology and stuff. And so there were heavy san- economic sanctions on North Korea, which prevented it from trading and stuff like that. So... The North Korean economy was absolutely cactus and they had to do things like a lot of illegal trading, whether it be fuel, timber, drugs, counterfeit money. They had to get pretty creative about their ways to get some hard currency. And so the Kim regime in North Korea had this agency since the the 70s called Division 39. And it's a pretty spooky agency that is basically charged with by whatever means possible getting involved in stuff to raise currency for the regime so my belief and my information is and what we you know we said in the podcast was that this had all the hallmarks of a division 39 operation working in tow with one of the major asian drug syndicates and division 39 and north korea supplied the ship and possibly chemically processed some of the heroin in North Korea because it was a type not seen before when the police seized it. And yeah, that's Division 39. So that takes it right to the to the heart of the of the regime because that's um they're the guys that get the uh the elites in North Korea their cognac and brandy and nice cars and all the luxury items that the the uh, average Joe will never see. So is the idea that, that North Korea, they would have done it for the money? Like, would that have been the motivation for this kind of operation? Absolutely, yeah. No, no other motive than, than getting a cut of the money. And at this stage, there's the sort of Asian syndicate on the ground and then they've also raided the ship. What 
then happens in terms of the investigation and interviewing suspects and trying to work out how they're going to put a case together? It's a really hard job to put together because it kind of is the ultimate circumstantial case because the ship had some documents on it and so did some of the members of the onshore syndicate waiting to receive the drugs that suggested the ship had been chartered by a Thai or Malaysian company called Kimto, which doesn't exist, to pick up a fleet of BMW cars in Melbourne, which never existed. It was a cover story created. It wasn't a very good one, but it, it, there, there was, you know, they, so they gave the crew an answer to say what were they doing there and, you know, and that they never saw any drugs. And interestingly, they'd never seen the two men who got in the rubber dinghy from the ship. They'd never seen them before in their lives, which is obviously untrue. But, you know, there was enough, enough doubt there. So it was a tough case. So the prosecutors in the AFP went to South Korea to actually interview some North Korean defectors to learn more about Division 39 and the role of a political secretary. So that was, like I said at the start, one of the guys on the ship wasn't a normal sailor. He was a political operative. So learning about that to build the case. And in some of the video the police took of when they um, were processing these guys after they brought them back to Sydney when the ship had been seized, you got a real sense of just how devoted they were to the regime. And all of them had these little lapels with the faces of North Koreans' leaders on them. And they, they said you can't take that off me. That is like taking my heart, this little badge. And then when the Australian immigration officer just put the, the lapel pin face down, the guy went nuts and, and then signalled with his hands, you know, and to upturned his palm to say, no, no, you must keep the face up. Stuff like that. So I think those little things give you an insight into just how real the devotion is to that regime and the leaders. And you get a sense just how strong the programming of these people has been. Um, So for me, it gave me a lot of empathy for their situation. That empathy is kind of a bit of a theme, I I think, because as the legal battle ensues, a special relationship builds between a suburban um, sort of Melbourne solicitor and one of the North Korean men. What happens there? I love this part of the story. The Melbourne solicitor is a guy called Jack Dalziel. And he is, a, you know, smart guy and stuff, but he's not a high-flying, top-end-of-town legal eagle. He's a suburban solicitor who proudly, unashamedly admits when asked, what's your specialty? Drugs, petty crime, pickpockets, that kind of thing. He was watching all that action at sea and the, the arrest of these guys on the news, and he felt sorry for the North Koreans, so he actually sent a fax to the North Korean embassy, which doesn't exist anymore in Canberra, but there was one at the time there, basically saying, hey, you guys need a lawyer. And didn't hear anything back. And then maybe a week to 10 days later, some men rocked up at his office in North Melbourne and holding his fax and said, Are you, where's this guy who sent the fax? And that's how he got engaged as a lawyer. And then he, yeah, he bonded strongly with the captain of the ship, Songman's son, but even more so with this really mysterious character who came out from North Korea called John Hak Bom. And he came out as the owner of the Pongsu ship. And he said it was a private company, not connected to government, which is obviously bullshit because everything's connected to the government there. And Hackbomb and Jack got along really well. So Hackbomb was really well educated. He'd been educated in Poland. He was able to travel quite freely internationally and he spoke reasonable English. And he was probably in his mid-30s then. So instantly Australian intelligence and and the Americans thought Hackbomb was definitely like a North Korean intelligence operative sent out to control this situation and run it down. But Jack just took him as he came and they, yeah, they developed this this strong friendship and would go out and eat at various restaurants around Melbourne. And in one case, he even took John Hackbomb up to country Victoria to his parents' farm to have um, a Sunday lunch with his mum and dad and, uh, and all that. And I love that. I reckon that's unreal. So this court case is, is happening and they're from North Korea, so I, I imagine that that makes it more complicated because they're not 
you know, Australians, what evidence is put forward in the court case and what actually happens in that room? There's two stages of the court battle. The first one is what's called committal, so where they go um, to test the evidence to see if there's enough for the North Koreans to stand trial. And so the AFP and the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions took a bit of a risky step and they charged everyone on the ship with with drug importation offences. It got to the magistrate's court in Melbourne and it was deemed that most of the crew, like the vast majority, um, there wasn't enough to say beyond reasonable doubt that they knew that this was going on and that the drugs were on the ship. So most of those guys got acquitted or, or not, not, not put up to stand trial and eventually were sent to the Woomera Detention Centre to await deportation. Before they went, they all got questioned by the Australian Crime Commission and there was some pretty interesting stuff that happened out of that, but we might come back to that. But um, that left the captain and his two senior officers um, who were committed to stand trial because, you know, it was highly questionable as to why the hell would that ship stop where it did, just coincidentally where the onshore guys who were taking possession and who were caught with the drugs were waiting. There could only really be one reason for that. So that was enough to get the captain and his two senior officers to stand trial. And what the federal police and the prosecutors did was go out to Woomera and grab the political secretary who had been not committed to stand trial. And they thought that was rubbish, that this guy was in on it too. He had to be because of his position. And they pulled him out of there and chose to directly present him. So they basically recharged him and said, we're going to present him to the Supreme Court. Then there was a big Supreme Court battle over the case and involving Jack Dalziel defending the remaining North Koreans, the captain and the political secretary, and uh, and the police and the prosecutors. And then the guys who had been caught, so the criminal syndicate guys who had actually been caught with the drugs, including the one who survived the, uh, the horrific <laughs> events um, down at Lawn, they all pled guilty because... They were all kind of caught red-handed or their fingerprints were all over the heroin and there was no point them um, going to trial because the evidence was clear. So they all pleaded guilty and got very, very hefty jail sentences and that was kind of, that was over. And so the, the, the big legal fight was over the captain, political secretary and the two officers and that went for oh, many, many, many months. And what did they determine? Well... <sighs> The jury came back with a, a not guilty verdict, which sort of, you know, obviously I wasn't in there every day, but yeah, it's a funny one. Maybe they thought they'd been through enough or maybe they thought going back home was more than enough punishment. I know amongst all the lawyers on both sides, there was a genuine fear about the welfare of um, the North Koreans, what might happen to them when they go back home because they the operation that had not been a success they'd lost a ship lost money and and importantly lost a lot of face because north korea had always denied being involved in drug trafficking and this was the best example of it and so in terms of the people who did go home who were sent back to north korea what do we know about their fate well, we we know nothing for certain um and that was one of the questions we tried to explore in the podcast, I asked Des Appleby, who was the leader of the federal police investigation into the whole Pong Su thing, about that. And he said he'd checked with the best sources that the federal police had internationally about the fate of the crew who were sent back before the captain and that faced trial. And, and Des's information from his sources was that they'd all been executed. And what do we know about those questions that they were asked sort of at the detention centre um, that you were talking about before? What, what was revealed in some of their responses? Most of the guys kept to the script of saying, I don't know anything. Um, you know, we were here to pick up cars or I didn't know what we were here for. Now I don't know anything about drugs. Never saw the guys. There was one guy, though, young guy called Jong Hok Dong, who was an operator in the radio room could communicate in English, and this was his first trip on the Pong Su. And my belief is that this guy was perhaps, again, maybe put there as a, as a military operative. He started 
passing notes to the Australian authorities out at Woomera saying, look, most of the crew are just innocent old, you know, sailors. They don't know any, they're not involved in this. Send them home. If you send them home, you keep these ones. And he said, including the political secretary, he goes, they know about it. I, I know about it. And he goes, I'll even tell you who to question and how to question them. And so for a while, it looked like he was trying to cut a bit of a deal to save some of the ordinary sailors and people on there so they could go home and cooperate. But obviously, he was taking a big risk because if the owners of the ship or the the North Korean government people out here found out about it, then I'd say he was up for it. Eventually, he, after a couple of days, said, oh, no, no, I don't mean any of that. I must have had a schizophrenic turn and just went back to saying nothing and he went home with the rest and we don't know what happened to him. You know, he's only 24, I think. The final question that I have is about the man whose body was found. Did we ever find out who he was or what his story was? Well, there was a coronial inquest into to try and answer those questions in Victoria uh, quite a long time ago and the coroner ruled that he couldn't say for any certainty what this guy's name was. He was given a couple of different alternatives by the guy Tarsar Wong, so who's the guy with him in the dinghy. They were clearly, clearly North Korean and clearly knew each other quite well. And interestingly, Wong, while he was still in jail in Victoria, serving out his, his sentence, wrote to the coroner and asked if and when he was able to leave Australia to take the remains of his dead friend with him. And the coroner thought long and hard about it, but just said, I can't do that because I can't, we don't even know who he is. We don't know whether or not you're going to take him back to family. But I thought that was a really touching thing after all those years. It, to me, showed a really strong bond and, and a care. So long story short, that guy, that dead North Korean guy, is still in an unmarked grave somewhere in suburban Melbourne. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks for the opportunity. If you look at the figures in 1999 of how many people a year were dying from heroin, it was up to about 1,200 people a year. And now it's back down to around 300 people a year. So we have made a difference. The 4,000-ton vessel was towed out to sea about 140 kilometres off the New South Wales south coast. An F-111 jet fighter lined up the vessel and bombed it. That syndicate won't be doing that again. That ship won't be doing it again. It's at the bottom of the ocean, so the results were very good. I think it did send a very strong message right around the world that Australia won't put up with this. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is a podcast hosted by Richard Baker from The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. You can find it at theage.com.au forward slash Pong Su or via the link in the description of this episode. As with all cases covered on True Crime Conversations, you can find pictures, maps and additional reading on this episode in our closed Facebook group. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook. If you have a story you'd like us to investigate on the podcast, you can email us directly at truecrime at mamamia.com.au. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper.